This week's show is brought to you by Manscaped, who are the best in the business in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels and is trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. And having recently launched in the UK, you can be one of the first men to experience their products. They've recently redesigned the electric trimmer, also known as the Lawn Mower 3.0, perfecting the greatest down-there trimmer ever created. Join the movement for all your below-the-waist grooming needs. Get 20% off and free delivery with the code WISDON at manscaped.com. Uh, we've had some supplies sent to the office, and all I say, it, it does the job well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on with the show. One hit as well, yes. That was impressive. <laughs> Deadpan. England lose their first home test series in seven years as a black cap side with six changes to it. Comfortably beat England at Edgebaston. We'll be talking about that test. The World Test Championship final. The England women's test at Bristol, the start of the T20 blast and more from the last week of cricket. There's also a new Wisdom Cricket Monthly out, so we'll, we'll be previewing that. And we've also got a pre-recorded conversation between Phil and Lord Botham about the 81 Ashes that took place 40 years ago. Lots to get through as always. I'm Yaz Ryan and with me today is former England batsman Mark Butcher, magazine editor of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Joe Harmon, and the editor-in-chief of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, Phil Walker. Let's start with the Test match. New Zealand won it by eight wickets, having bowled England out for not many in the second innings. We've had lots and lots of listener questions about this. I think listeners prefer it almost when England lose. Um, Nick Beale asks, how can you fix the England Test team? What is sport? Asks, how can England improve their batting? Jamie Capper asks, any chance Butch could dust off his pads? Um, but we've also, we had, we had loads of questions about England's batting, but we also had a, this question from Billy Johnson who asks, is there a massive overreaction to this series defeat and especially the batting? These past two games are the first times I can remember a real collapse from England in England under Silverwood, and they have shown they're capable of making big runs before. Joe, do you think that's broadly fair? Well, it's interesting the point that Billy says in England, because it's hard to take this series in complete isolation from what's gone on over the winter. I mean, they are in different places, but this is another batting collapse to follow a lot of what we've seen. Um, but I think we do find it shocking in, in home conditions when England looks so out of their depth against admittedly what's a very good side but the, the Kiwis had made a lot of changes uh, and I think England fans have every right to, to feel aggrieved for, in, in lots of ways to be honest the fact that England didn't pick their best side in the first place which we've obviously gone over ad nauseum but then when you get thrashed like this it's naturally going to come up again um, the fact that England have got some very clearly very talented batsmen for whatever reason whether it's technique or approach just don't seem to be able to do it consistently um, so no I, I don't think it is an overreaction really. I think if England go on to beat India, then this New Zealand series will be relatively quickly forgotten. But I don't rate their chances particularly highly the way things are going at the moment. Um, India will have obviously had a World Test Championship final to warm up for their series against England. And I think they have to go into that series as favourites now. Mm. A point that a lot of people have made is that despite the rest and rotation, uh, five of England's first choice top six did play that series. Um, and I don't think it's been that long since people were quite optimistic about England's batting as well. Um, the openers are, have been solid enough in the first choice team. You've got Root, Stokes, Butter in the middle and Crawley and Pope are the two great young batting hopes throwing Lawrence as well. Um, but what, what do you think's happened with Pope in the last year or so? He looked he looked the real deal in South Africa at the start of 2020 and, and runs, uh, to be honest, I know his, his overall numbers for Surrey this season look really good, but I'm not that surprised by how he's gone for England. He's looked a bit frenetic at the crease. He's actually only passed 50 twice for Surrey this season. So what, what do you think's happened with Pope? Yeah, yeah. Um... Good day, everybody. Um, it, it's it's interesting because there are so many there are so many things at play here throughout the entire batting lineup, not just for somebody like Ollie Pope. Obviously, off the back of a winter where where runs were so difficult to come by for for all of that batting lineup, with the exception perhaps of Rory Burns because he was pulled out of the firing line after the after the, what was it the second Test match. Um, confidence is not particularly high, and you and you feel. Particularly when you're when you're starting out in Test match cricket, and the average is you know you're, you're kind of hovering around the 30s or whatever, and you know you feel as though there's a bit of pressure on you. You come off the back of a series where you haven't been able to score a run or show anything uh, like what you can do, you're always feeling a bit under the pump. You run into a very very good bowling attack um, in New Zealand in the, uh, in the first well in both Test matches, um, and you know th it doesn't go well. Also, some of the players, a lot of the players. Pope in particular, Crawley also, who have played quite a bit of county cricket at the beginning of this summer, um, have all kind of fallen into this extraordinary um, vortex of batting on off stump, standing stock still as the ball is being released, 
and finding yourself having no idea where your where your orientation is, where your off stump is, playing at wide balls, missing straight ones, and not scoring any runs. So for that, you know, the player, all players are responsible for their own technique. It's you, you make the decision as to how you want to set up, how you want to play, the type of backlift you want, all of these types of things. You have coaches to guide you and help you to make the best of that, but it is a player's responsibility over his technique and therefore his run scoring. They've decided that this is the way to go. I don't understand it. If you, if you saw NASA, he had a terrific rant at the end of the test match, um, something very much akin to what I was saying two weeks before here in the Surrey Middlesex game. Um, and, and that's not working out particularly well. And it seems to be a disease that is afflicting batting right the way through English cricket in, in, long, form, in long form stuff. So that, that's another issue. Um, in terms of an overreaction, it would be an overreaction had we all sort of thought, you know, why England are going into this in terrific shape. You know, all of the thinking is perfectly clear. Uh, you know, they should give uh, New Zealand the runaround because, you know, we haven't lost a series at home for 2014. And then suddenly this happens as a, as a complete and utter shock and surprise. And everyone's kind of a bit aggressive is not the right word, but a bit upset that, oh, you know, how could this possibly have happened? The reason the reaction is the reaction is because we're all sat here for the last three weeks in the lead up to this going, this isn't going to go well. This is not going to go well. You know, the thinking, the thinking behind selection, the thinking in terms of resting players, the thinking that um, if you do not have Ben Stokes in your team, you cannot pick a balanced side. It is not, it's not possible. The fact that, the fact that you have um, all-rounders in, in Wokes and Moeen Ali, who for some reason, having played virtually no cricket whatsoever, could not have been brought in to try and balance out the team. The fact that somebody like Jack Leach is not trusted um, enough to, be, to, to hold an end in the, in the first innings and bowl lots of overs and try and win you a game in the second. And granted, they would have had nothing to bowl at in this test match, all right? No problem. But the thinking, as far as everything goes, has led to the, led to the point where the reaction is not an overreaction. The reaction is, this was an accident waiting to happen. We've just watched it happen. And now you're in this bizarre position with a series coming up against India where with so many unanswered questions, you're kind of like a little bit panicking as to what to do. You know, none of the top order are going to have any cricket, any, or hardly any four-day cricket between now and that series starting. How do any of these guys go back and remedy the, the problems when they're playing T20 cricket or maybe making an appearance in the 100 or making appearances in, in that 50-over comp, whatever the hell that is? Um, and so you think to yourself, well, India, if we, if we manage to even nick a test match off India, the way that things look at the moment, it will be extraordinary. Um, and that is even with bringing in the likes of Ben Stokes and, and Josh Butler. God forbid something happens to Ben Stokes. God forbid Ben Stokes is unfit, does his back in before, before the first test against India, or, or something worse means he misses out on the ashes. Because apparently there is nothing you can do. Nothing can be done if Ben Stokes is not available to be selected to pick a balanced cricket team. Nothing. Before you, you, you go on, magnificent start to a Tuesday morning, that. <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, you mentioned that a coach's role is to, you know, cajole and encourage and facilitate in the, in the margins of it, but it's the player's responsibility to look after their technique, right? But a lot of people would have gone to Edgbaston this week and seen hordes and hordes and hordes of coaches, you know, doing everything from making the tea... To, to getting on the bowling machine and the whole lot. Now, England's head batting coach is a is good mate of yours and a, you know, a great cricketer and a good man and all of that. But people will be looking at, listening to this show and thinking, well, is there not a greater responsibility for the coaches to, to get hold of these players who are maybe garbling themselves by over-analysis? And if what NASA said last week and if what you said with Atherton and so on the week before that, if you're, if you're right, then... If you're sharing a beer with Graham Thorpe, he would agree with you because you you know you know the game, you're of that era. Why is why is Graham Thorpe and to and Silverwood as well and others and their county coaches why if there's something fundamentally taking place here technically that shouldn't be from the top order down, why are they not being more proactive? Well, I, I, we don't know that they're not. My my guess is a, is that they are, and they're making the making a very strong suggestion that. Perhaps you're not making life as simple for yourself as, as, as would be right. necessary. But the, the player has to... to look, I, I, can I make an example, right? And I don't do this for... In fact, I never do this. But I'm going to use myself as, as an example, right? Prior to um, 
a very, very jammy recall to the England side in 2001. I played 25, maybe 27 test matches, average 25, right? Made 200s, numbers not good enough, out of the team. No issue with that whatsoever. Then went in a spiral where I was out of the Surrey team and playing second team cricket and thinking about jacking the whole thing in, okay? I had a technique which had been serviceable up to a point but was, that was getting in my way. I had two choices. One was to quit because I was hating every second of it and the other one was to do something about it. So I decided to do something about it. I called AR Butcher, technical coach par excellence as far as I'm concerned and a lot of other people would agree with me and, told, and said to him, treat me like I'm a baby. Treat me like I have never picked up a cricket bat before, right? And we stripped the whole thing back to nothing and started again. The reason and, and, what, and what he did was, was to, make, to give me the building blocks to do everything so simply that the movements and, and where I was positioned and my, where my balance was and where my weight was would not be something that would be getting in my way. It would be good deliveries, bad decision making, etc., etc. The technical side of it was to stay out of the way. And that was the simplicity of it all. So oh, and from that point, I got back in the side in 2001. I averaged 40 for the next 42 test matches, right? Batting at three for England. Okay, ended up with an average of 34, and people will say, "Well, you know, average player." That's that's what the that's what the other England guys are doing. But I'm just I'm just illustrating what can be done technique-wise if you're open enough to it. So the, the the question you asked about the responsibility of the coach is the coach. My old man said to me, "I'd wanted to change that, change things for you for quite a long time before you made the call." But he wouldn't he want said, to go near but you he until didn't, you said, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because he because. We wouldn't have, I wouldn't have then given him the, the right amount of time to be able to do it. I mean, it wouldn't have been something where we were working together to reach the same goal. And that is what has to happen with the player. So it, it isn't, it's, and I hear this from cricketers, whether they be club cricketers or, 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 you know, international players, that in cricket, for some reason, batsmen in particular seem to have this idea that you have this way of playing and that's it. There's not much else you can do. Now, as from watching, from loving golf and from watching the best in somebody like Tiger Woods or any of these other guys, they are constantly changing their swing, moving things around, trying to find the sort of like the, the perfect, and perfect doesn't exist, by the way, but trying to find a way of doing something that is the most efficient that they can manage. And that's, that's all. all and, what, and what we are saying and what the, the likes of us who, who don't play anymore, and this is not harping back to, you know, things were better in my day because they weren't. There's no guarantee you're going to score runs even with the most perfect setup in the universe. But the point we're trying to make is this, is that international bowlers are bloody good. Test match cricket is bloody hard. So if you are starting off from a position where you're making life more difficult for yourself before the ball has even... <laughs> excuse me. Before the ball has <laughs> even been bowled... Right. Your chances of success become fewer and fewer and fewer, less and less and less. And that is all. And, and all, we're look, all we're seeing is people tangling themselves up in knot. And then, you know, on the converse side of that, you see Devin Conway never played a test match before, makes 200 on debut. With, with, I mean, does anybody remember anything specifically about the way he played? No, because it was straightforward, basic, stand on middle and leg stump. Get your body into a position where the bat can come down in a straight line and prevent the, present the full face of the bat to the ball. That's it. And the guy who replaced um, the other... Uh, Will man. Young. Will Young. Same. Right? Nothing quirky about it. Nothing weird. Sideways on. Present the full face of the bat. You're in good shape. And that's all they did. Is, is and it, you can't say that our boys can't bowl. You know, <laughs> our yeah. boys have got 1,300 test wickets between them. And they couldn't get them out. But how much of it is just technique? So like... If, if Pope starts batting on middle and leg uh, next test match, that's, that doesn't solve all, all of England's problems. No, 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 because, you know, you've got, you've got the, the confidence issue. Confidence is now at an all-time low, which is where, you know, why I mentioned the India series beforehand. You kind of go into it and you feel like you're, you feel like you're, you're behind. So you kind of, you know, you're desperate to try and get a score on the board and that desperation can turn into tension, that tension can turn into making errors. But again, you know, there's a, there was an argument that rages along the lines of, well, you know, t it's not technique, it's, you know, it's what's going on in, in between the ears, it's mental, it's, it's this, it's softness, whatever it might be. Again, I will, I will use myself as an example again. When I knew my technique was working fine, my brain worked very, very well, thank you very much. Because you have less, you know, you're not concerned about where you are, how, how you're feeling, your balance, you know where you're off, everything is then on autopilot. All you have to do from there is watch the ball. So the idea that technique doesn't play any sort of part 
in bad form at all is compl- is ludicrous. But, ludicrous. But with that in mind, then is it not concerning to hear Thorpe? And you know, he's facing the press after he got thrashed. It's a difficult job. You can't then just hammer your own batsman. But but he said this is a this is an approach thing. This is a mental thing. This isn't a technique thing. And he even went on to say that the hundred they play a few games in the hundred beforehand. That would be a good thing because it will free them up. Which seemed like a, a, an odd thing. Maybe to be saying. I mean, you obviously you need to protect your players, and we see this with coaches in all sports, Absolutely. in all international sport. But he's not. He's not going to. We, we are. We he, are. Well, we're journalists, but we're also fans, and we've watched England very, 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 very badly. And he's not going to tell you. He's like not going to tell some, you what he's telling them. No, but I think a lot of fans would like to hear some kind of recognition that things aren't right at the moment. I think people would have kind of respect for that, but. There is, there is a sense that there's almost a bit of denial in the way that the batsmen are playing and in the way the coaching staff are talking. Yeah, potentially. There could be. I mean, uh, we're not good. That we won't know because, you know, we, we, assume, we assume that there are no conversations going on behind closed doors to, to, to remedy either technical failings or, or, or failings of any other sort. And I, I can guarantee you that won't be the case. I mean, there's no, there is nothing worse. I mean, you, you, nothing worse than kind of going away from a cricket ground having you know with two days left of the test match knowing that you, that fans are kind of have missed out on on their day's entertainment knowing that you've lost a game knowing that you're going to get hammered and shows like this for the next three or four days it's, ter- it's terrible and so you're looking for solutions um to that all of the time i mean you know there, there's a question that hasn't been asked just yet and that is you know are are these guys the right guys as far as far as ollie pope's concerned i think absolutely yes um, as far as Zach Crawley is concerned, if you asked me this last summer, I'd have said absolutely yes. You know, it's a, it's a one of those, another one of those picks, um, you know, on talent as opposed to on uh, to on numbers. But he seems to have got himself so tied up in knots technically that mentally he's got no chance either. Dom Sibley and, and Rory Burns, you know, that they're not everybody's cup of tea. Um, and I think uh, they get grouped together a little bit harshly as well, those two, because they are quixotic looking players. Yeah. But, but there is daylight, I think, between the two of them. And if, it, if we go back technically again, look at Burns. There is, a, there, is, there is a flow to his game. There's a lot going on beforehand, as we know, but there is a flow to his game. He can play perpendicular shots when it's, when it's in at the bodies. He's added that to his game. If anything, that second innings, that, that disastrous shot that he played first up, that was, if anything... A, Consequence of his of his confidence, you know, overconfidence that he was feeling good in his, yeah. in his game. He's he's Sib- one, Sibley. He's one of the guys that I would say Rory Burns, where I'd say that sort of me- mentally, his kind of that's his his issue is kind of you know not not getting too far ahead of himself and kind yeah. of you know be, being as patient as he was in the first thing. So I, yeah. I'd, I'd agree with that one hundred percent, hundred percent. Sibley, on the other hand, is another one where you could sort of say, wow, I mean, you, how long are you going to last, kind of playing like that? Yeah, um, you know, having to face 150 balls to get 40, you're kind of, you know, you're, again, you're making life very, very tough for yourself. And he has, um, but, he, but he does have, and, and this is the, this is kind of to, to back up Silverwood and the and the, the selectors a little bit. Remember where he where his selection appeared from. His selection appeared from 30 for four every game. You know, so th- there is a reason behind having somebody who has the sort of like the mental capacity to grind out for long periods of time. Yeah. And and uh, look, so I, I, I'm no, you know, I, I would love it. I'd prefer it if Dom Sibley were Graham Gooch, obviously. But at the moment, you kind of got what you've got. You do, but you also have other players in the wings. And, and the thing with Sibley... Go on, him. Well, I mean, Hamid was in the squad. Hamid and Kane Williams had a 20-minute conversation on the outfield after the game, and, and I saw him in the nets, and he's obviously scored a lot of runs this year. It might be too early for him, come what may. But just, just going back to Sibley briefly, and I don't, I don't want to kind of target him necessarily, but this notion that he's not everyone's cup of tea, he's only got one way of playing, but he does a job for England, that may be the case from tomorrow, but it's not really been the case up to now. He's, he's made something like nine or ten single-figure scores in his last 18 or 19 innings. So this idea that he's a one, one-paced kind of player, but he sees off the cherry and allows the stroke makers in the afternoon, that's not really happening either a lot of the time. He's, he's unable to get through the new ball, let alone develop his innings when the ball gets a little bit softer. So... so <laughs> He's given everything he's got, Sibley. He has this this homespun technique, which is right on the edges of of workability, isn't it? And if there's one thing that's slightly off, then the bat is coming from out there, and he's he's late on it some of the time. And you saw it in that second innings. That delivery from Matt Henry was not an absolute jaffer. All right, it held its line, 
But it's just a, a straight up and down ball outside off stump. Now, either you leave it or you cover it. This is not boomeranged away from him. And yet, the bat was coming down through so many different sort of peculiar angles and wends its way around the back roads before finally coming down. Uh, and he's too late on it, so he nicks off. The same applies when there's a, a long half volley outside off stump. He has to come through so many different avenues to get there. And while he has immense concentration and cussedness, and he's a really likable bloke as well, and we, I understand why England fans want a Sibley-esque player to work, but my concern, having watched him for two years, is that he's not quite the player to fulfil the role that he's rightly put in place for. I completely get that. I completely get that. But I do think it's his record in England is, is, is pretty good. Those numbers look very bad because that included that winter tour that went badly for most of them. Um, and I guess part of um, the whole discussion in England batsmen is kind of just what you just asked. Who's, who's outside this team? Who's I, banging I down would, the door? I would got... love to see Hamid in it. I would love to what, see straight, that. So for the India series? I would love to see that. Interesting. But this yeah. is, um, I mean, this is the problem. We're talking, reading the papers over the last few days, that the two saviours of England's best test batting lineup are Hamid, who until very recently had scored 104 and a half years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and David Milan, who has had 15 test matches, got on Ashes 100, but is averaging below 30. Uh, is only... th- about to turn 34 and has only played four first class games since the start of last season I mean this and I, to be honest I think Milan is probably worth another look he's got a kind of bloody mindedness that I think will serve him potentially quite well in test cricket he's got an Ashes 100 which is potentially very useful at this point in terms of selection questions um, and even though it's a completely different format he's shown he's got the bottle for international cricket he's done well in T20 cricket that said I don't think he's going to change anything dramatically I still think England have got more or less the best side it's just not working. Hmm. And I think I, I completely take Phil's point on Sibley and you watch him and you think this is just, this isn't going to work. And then he'll pull out on innings just as you're kind of losing faith to think, well, we'll give him another shot. But crucially as well, are we prepared to jump back on the merry-go-round? He, he was scoring so many more runs than anyone else in counting cricket. We've tried pretty much all the other openers who have also largely lost form. If you look at someone like who hasn't been tried yet, Gubbins, not pickable at the moment. Stoneman's obviously lost form. There aren't a vast amount of options out there. And I thought one, an interesting name, which I thought about quite a lot over the last few days, is someone like Joe Clark, who scored a magnificent T20 100 only a few days ago uh, and is the most talented non-capped English batsman in the country, I, I would say. Clearly a huge talent. But this is a guy who scored six first-class hundreds in his second year of first-class cricket as a teenager. I think over the last four years, he's averaging 32, 33. So how... And this is obviously a broader question. How is Joe Clark now, at least going by numbers, a worse first-class red ball batsman now than he is when he came through? Is, I mean, everyone will have their theories on, on county cricket pitches. Is it a kind of... Is it his focus is now on white ball cricket? But he told Phil in an interview only a few months ago that test cricket is where he wants to be, that he feels ready to play it well his numbers suggest otherwise mm. his, his recent t20 record is is ridiculous he's striking at nearly two near enough 200 um but but, but i think that 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 is quite interesting we were talking about this before we started recording that if you're the eighth or ninth best red ball batsman in the country you're a county player you're not in the england team if you're the eighth or ninth best white ball batsman in the country you're making a lot of money in in leagues around the world that, that must come into it surely if you're if you're a player on the outside of the england setup it, yeah it, it does um but the other side of it is that English, young English batsmen play more first-class red ball cricket than any, any of their counterparts around the world, by miles. And there's a lot, of, a lot of crap thrown at the system, and there is always that understandable response to a humiliating defeat. Humiliating two weeks, really, when you think about the Lord's Day 5 as well, which I know you boys spoke about last week. Um, it's been a bad two weeks, on and off the pitch for English cricket, no doubt. And there's an understandable response, I get that. Look at the system. Look at the the, the way that the the schedules have so have been squeezed, and Red Bull cricket has been deprioritized, arguably, and so on and so on. I just want to give you a quick example: Henry Nichols and Dan Lawrence, right, batting in the same position, five, five or six. Um, Henry Nichols debuted five years, first class debut, five years before Dan Lawrence. He's six years older than Dan Lawrence. Dan Lawrence is twenty three and a bit. Nichols is twenty nine. They've played the same amount of first-class cricket, bar two games. Dan Lawrence is two games shy of Henry Nichols. Henry Nichols bats like a cussed, gnarly test match batsman, as if he's been playing forever and a day. And Dan Lawrence is 
this kind of greenhorn maverick kid that may or may not crack it and so on and is somehow some sort of product spat out of our system where we're obsessed with white ball cricket and we don't give red ball cricket any respect etc etc Dan Lawrence has already played 88 first class games by the age of 23 right so this notion that we just throw them to the wolves is not backed up by the, fig the facts and the figures it's just not there and if you talk to Lawrence just to pick him out as an example he said as I said to you on the show before, Red Bull Cricket, that's where, for me, my, my money is. That's where my head is. That's where my career is. Red Bull Cricket. Red Bull Cricket. And, he's, and that's his priority. And it's borne out by the numbers. He's played far more Red Bull games than he has White Bull games. Uh, he's 23 years and old. If, and if you get an England Test Match contract, you're on three quarters of a million quid. Yeah, and, and Red Bull Cricket is Crawley's priority. It's Pope's priority. I, I don't think that, that might be an issue in terms of the number of players coming through. I don't think it's the issue in terms of the, the players who've actually got in the yeah. side. But, but some do. And there's been a lot of pieces written and, and, and comments made in the last few days that, that allude to that, that we're not giving it, that these, at these lads any chance of proper success because we've turned everything around and all the traditions of English cricket have been rejected and inverted. Well, I don't see that in the numbers. Mm. We've talked about the test quite a lot, but a couple of other players I want to talk about briefly. Crawley is an interesting one. I think people who work in cricket probably have a, quite a different view on him to people who, who don't, I think, in that his numbers don't leap off the page. He averages 31 in first-class cricket now over 60-odd games, 29 in test cricket and 25 in first-class cricket this summer. His dismissal in the first innings really wasn't great. I thought he hinted at a kind of frazzled mind. What do you think is happening there? And, and, and do you think he can... He, You'd, would you play him in the first test against India? There's very little cricket between now and that first test. A couple of rounds of the championship and a lot of blast cricket. But would, would you keep him in? Uh, I thought his, his first innings, his very brief first innings, was, was quite shocking, actually, just to see how frazzled his mind had got. Um, and especially when you contrast it to what we saw last summer. The thing is, the anomaly in his career so far is that innings last summer. You say his, his numbers don't leap off the page. Well, they're starting to, but in the wrong way. I mean, he has had a horrible trot in test cricket. And if you don't have the weight of runs in first-class cricket um, to fall back on in the way that Sibley does, Pope does, Lawrence does, Crawley doesn't have that record. So, I mean, I, I'd still think he'll, he'll, he will have a successful test career, but I think there's probably more work to be done outside of the test team before he, he gets that point. So if I was to lose one of the current batting lineup, I would actually lose him before Sibley. To take him moment. out of the firing line. In a yeah, place, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Crawley will end up playing more test matches than Sibley by the end of their career. But based on the evidence that I saw uh, at Edgebaston, I think Crawley could probably do with a do with a breather. And a, and a question related to kind of the struggles of the young players. James DeMello asked, would it benefit Pope and Lawrence to be given a run in the ODI side of the next six weeks and get more international cricket under their belts? Obviously, they're neither are that close to the ODI side at the moment, but... Who's going to run that one past Owen Morgan? That's, that's a very good question. It's a very good question. But given that there's not that much cricket left for the start of that India series... What was the guy? What was his name? Uh, James. James. I, I, would, I would imagine James. Given that, that England could not find a way of um, trying, to, trying to fit in Chris Wokes or Moeen Ali to a test side to try and win a test match... Um, that the likelihood of them doing that to their one day side is is next to non existent. Um and, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure it would be that much help either, to be honest. Could it could it actually be a hindrance? If we saw what no, happened to Bairstow's think, test career based no, on how I don't, he, how I don't well think he did. I don't think it'd be a hindrance, but I just don't think it would make a massive amount of difference. I mean they're all these guys are gonna play once they're not playing in the test matches, they're gonna be playing blast and hundred cricket, aren't they? Sorry, was this the question regarding where they play? And the way, kind of the yeah. thought experiment, yeah. and the Pope way, and Lawrence, and the way that and the way that and the way that England want to play their one-day cricket is not to give people a net. You know, they want to go out there and and, and score it and score three hundred plus every time they go out and bat. So I, I would I would say that that's for lots of reasons. I mean, it's an idea. It's something that they might have done. You know, might have done in the old Texaco Trophy days when white ball cricket wasn't of any importance. Back <laughs> those days, yeah, but not now. Um, but the, I guess an additional point to that is that, you know, I just picked Lawrence because Essex only have the one game. He's got two innings until the, the next test match in, what, five weeks? Five or six weeks? Yeah, long, yeah. August? Yeah. August. So he's, he's got two hits against the Red Bull. Now, while 
the majority who are following county cricket have really enjoyed the two month condensed period and thought that it's really given the the championship an extra bit of oomph and narrative and so on that we can really get with the flip side is that now going into the big bit of the summer red ball cricket internationally where are you going to get your your practice in mm. right and I, so, hey, I this is problematic few, right bumped into a few of the players over the last uh, last week going round after the blast and and the bowlers as you'd expect in particular are absolutely hanging after playing eight nine championship games in eight nine weeks absolutely hanging um so you know i like i said i've kind of enjoyed it but i you know, it's formatting wise but in terms of scheduling it's a, it's a disaster it's a disaster for lots of reasons obviously that being one player fatigue bowler fatigue um, and also the fact that you're just not going to play any championship. I mean, we had, we had this, I think might have been my first pod. You know, you get the conditions changed throughout the course of an English summer, and the, and the and England, English batsmen are not going to get the chance to bat at the best time of the summer. I think we could do a whole pod June, on a, July. On a they're not county cricket schedule. June, July, August. <laughs> you know, that's, where, that's where you cash in, yeah. and they're not going to get a chance to bat in it. So it's a, I don't know, it's yeah. a mess. Um, yeah, just a couple, couple of other final points on England. I think it's quite interesting that Roots uh, struggles is a, is probably the wrong word, but for quite a long time now, he, he averages about 33 in home tests over three and a half years now, which is quite a long time. And I think that's kind of gone under the radar given the struggles of everyone else. And, it's um, the elephant in the room, isn't it? Yeah, I have to be quite a long time. And, and, and that his return return to form in inverted commas at the start of the year, three massive hundreds, they were in completely different conditions, pr- exclusively against spin. And I don't think you can read anything from those innings into how, in terms of how he will go for the rest of this summer and the Ashes, unfortunately. I, um, I he didn't you. have that great a start to the county championship season either. I bet you that, I mean, being at home, being the England captain at home comes with a heck of a lot more extraneous and external responsibilities than it does when you're away from home. A man of experience <laughs> <laughs> for a week. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it does. Yeah. There, 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 there is that. And also, but particularly over the last couple of weeks, I mean, I felt very sorry for him this test yeah. match. He can't have been going out with a clear mind. He's apt to deal with some incredibly difficult questions, which I thought actually handled really well in the lead up. Uh, it's a mess and very little of it, or perhaps none of it, is his own doing. Um, he's, not, he's not had his best team in a year, is he? Pretty much. I can't. I mean, what he spoke to, we talked about an interview he did, was it with, with the Daily Mail, where he said, I hope we never have the situation overseas again. But that's about it. I think he's done, it says a lot about him as a bloke that he's managed to kind of keep a lid on this because it, it's probably counterproductive to to throw his toys out of the pram, but I, I wouldn't blame him if he did. But but when I, also though, just in brackets, we don't need to go back to technique. Joe has been playing around with his with his technique so much again in the last year or two. I happened to catch what was it, twenty fifteen when Broad bowled Australia out in a, in an hour, and then Root made the most amazing hundred and twenty at Trent Bridge on day one when the ball was meant to be going around corners, and it was so pure and it was so rhythmical and it was so beautiful. And compare and contrast that when the world was opened up to him, you know, and everything was beautiful and he had no pressure on his shoulders and he could just go out and play. Compare that to the innings on Sunday, Saturday, Saturday afternoon, um, which was the most forlorn Joe Root innings I can ever remember. One, four in 60 odd, no kind of natural rhythm, no flow, no anything. And you could sense just the colour just draining out of him, you know, and, and he dragged himself off after nicking off and, and it just felt like a sort of doleful Joe Root, yeah. which is in complete polar contrast to, to to that impish, brilliant kid that we saw just a few years ago. The numbers back that up as well. The he job a- takes its toll, right? He averaged, he averaged um, 60 at home up until the end of his first year as captain and averages 32 since. Oh, both Both with quite large um, sample sizes now. Um, and one other, one other point I just wanted to make, and we don't need to have a discussion on it, we talked about the rest and rotation policy a lot. I did think it was a bit a bit sad almost that you had that full house who was obviously loving it and you didn't have your best available team there. And I know we've talked about the ins and outs of the rest and rotation policy to death on this show, but I thought it was a great shame that you had pretty much a full house for the first time in nearly two years and you didn't have the best available team when you had someone from New Zealand in Trent Bolt who'd gone to, from the IPL to New Zealand straight into a test match. And, and um, Chris Wokes lives eight mile up the road exactly, in exactly. Sutton yeah. Coldfield. Yeah. Did you see Harmit? Harmit had, 
yeah. Steve Armisen had a, a superb rant that I caught on Twitter last yeah. night saying exactly that. So right. he's, he's flown 10,000 miles to come back and represent his country and Chris Wokes is 10 miles up the road with his feet up. And desperate not, to play. Yeah, and it's, desperate to play, adding, yeah. yeah. And desperate to play. It's not his I mean, fault. Yeah. Think again, again, but we've had this com- we had this conversation before the series started. This is, again, why the reaction is not a, an overreaction. All of these things... All of these things were brought up in terms of kind of respecting, respecting the test matches, respecting the fans, all of these things. And so, you know, is what it is. Mm. It's, not as though, it's not as though we haven't called it that this was, this was likely to happen. One last, last thing. 2014, the last time England lost a series yeah, at home. Yeah, so, you know, before we all just turn off our mics and jump over that balcony, let's just bear <laughs> that in mind as well, I suppose. That's a very fair point. Very fair point. Um, we should probably talk about the team that won the game, New Zealand. Uh, obviously very impressive again. But Brilliant. Po- probably the, 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 mo- the most striking thing is how they had six changes to that side and Matt Henry comes in, Will Young comes in, Ajaz Patel comes in and they, they look very good straight away. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the World Test Championship later on the show. Um, but that but that is a side with with a fraction of the resources that England but has. So so what are, so what do they do? Okay, uh, I'm not talking about their their domestic league. I'm not talking about you know how that how their players play anymore. What do they do when they replace players? They bring in people who who do a job like for like. So it's not a question of um, you know we're going to worry we're going to complain that we now can't balance the team because one individual is going. If we lose an opening batsman, we bring in an opening batsman. If we lose a wicketkeeper batsman, we bring in a wicketkeeper batsman. If we're going to have a, a, a spin bowling option, we replace him with another like for like spin bowling option. We lose a, we lose our, a, a pace bowler or two. We replace them with another with a like for like pace bowler. Right. So they have an idea about the type of cricket that they want to play and the type of personnel that they need to be able to play it, and then they. And then they replace them. They bring in people who do the same thing so that they can maintain the way that they want to play and have options open to them throughout the course of the five days. What do we do? We lose one guy and the entire thing goes, out, goes up in smoke. Yeah. You, can't pl- you cannot play a balanced team anymore because you lost one bloke. They lost six. <laughs> six! <laughs> I was imagining if, if Will Young was English and played that role, you can just imagine like media action, like England's Ashes host. Oh, oh, great, oh, yeah, we'd, we'd be winning. We'd yeah, exactly. be six the people, they six. Yeah, and and also imagine being uh, it, New Zealand are most likely not going to play Will Young in the World Test Championship final. Imagine being in a position where you can um, or Henry, he won't play either. Exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, Phil, just, just very briefly yeah, as well yeah. on those as well though. You know, Nichols plays one day cricket, Black Caps cricket. Yeah. Um, Williamson obviously, Taylor, Latham, they all play. They all play that format as well, right? So this is not that they've kind of siphoned off the test match players and said that's what you that's all you do. They've looked at the full landscape and all the resources and they've expertly organized that around their schedules to ensure that that they can produce brilliance now. And and it's not just it's not plucky quality, it's brilliance. You know, that was a serious cricket team and it deserves more credit than than it gets. But then it's understandable that when you look at a defeat like that then that's what you focus on but for one team to play badly another team's got to play well and they were at times they were absolutely brilliant in Conway I mean where can that kid go you know I'm not getting carried away here I I don't think I've seen a more technically sound start to a test career and yeah I mean the 80 odd he made which I saw I was up there and I saw it that's as good an 80 odd technically as, as you can imagine. And also, if you're going to get out, if you're going to get out, what a way to get out. What a way to go. <laughs> I called, called I re- Deep Square with yeah, the Did you see Lindsay on it afterwards? No, he, I didn't. He, he, he's no. Like, uh, he was asked about it. Uh, cause, cause, uh, and, he, and he basically said, yeah, hit it. probably hit it better than I, <laughs> I imagined. We didn't mean to hit it in the air. So it was, yeah, but, the, but this is what they're doing. They are yeah. now bringing in quality yeah. as well. Uh, Jameson as well. You know, in, in previous eras, New Zealand, would if you lose two or three... Then you bring in workman-like cricketers in there in the slipstream, but also, now also we're saying how real can quality. It, we're saying how can England's red ball batsmen possibly find form when they haven't got any games before the India series? Well, Conway before the uh, Lord's Test hadn't played a red ball game since March. So I mean, it is it is achievable. Yeah. It's not just practice, it, is yeah, it? it? Absolutely, it is. Hey, I'll, I'll read you something. Right, um, uh, la, 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 let's have a look. Devon Conway's coach, right, guy called. His surname's Pocknell. I can't, Glenn Pocknell. Here we go. He was asked, did he make any technical changes to suit the standard of test match batting? 
And he said, oh, yeah, we made one small change. Um, the way he prepared himself in terms of his feet movement facing up to the bowler, did some research on Coley, Root, De Villiers, etc. He said he looked at their position at release when the bowler was bowling the ball, and we looked at his position at release and discussed that and came to the conclusion that it needs to be slightly different. We just changed his feet position and changed his trigger. So basically, he was giving himself more time once the ball was delivered. Prior to that, and this is the kicker, prior to that, he was standing still on the crease. And look, he was still a great batsman, don't get me wrong, but by making this small change, he gave himself more time. What do the England batters do? What are they talking about? What, are they, what is this change in technique? Not only are they taking an, a middle and off, off stump guard, but they're standing stock still. No rhythm. The ball comes out and suddenly you're in a rush because you've, got, you've not started moving yet or you haven't moved soon enough. I remember Nick Compton having it struggling with that with the series that he got left out of the side. I think it might have been against New Zealand, funnily enough. Getting nailed on the crease, standing in front of all three stumps, standing stock still until the ball was delivered. So the thing that Devon Conway changed from first-class cricket, where he was scoring an absolute mountain of runs, by the way, to test match cricket, was just to move a little bit sooner, get himself a, a trigger position, get a little bit of rhythm into his batting, move before the ball is coming. And that was something that we all talked about back in the day. Do not be caught stock still when the ball is on the way out of the bowler's hand because you will be late. You will not be fast enough. You will end up playing around your front pad. You'll end up missing the damn thing, right? That's what he said, and that's how many runs he scored. By doing something that would have been sort of second nature to, to batsmen of a different, a different era. So you heard it from the horse's mouth. Absolutely. Technique matters. Phil, what's your moment of the week? Well, being up there and, and being in a commentary box for a few days with Jeremy Coney, has to be. Uh, I mean, where do you start? I mean, it's, it's probably ironic that I'm lost for words because he never is my word. He, he has, I don't know, a facility with language that is untouched, really, in our game. Um, even Norcross has to bow down to him from time to time, which doesn't come easily for the old boy. Um, Jeremy Coney kind of sort of drifts through through commentary boxes when called upon and always elevates them whenever he's there and the BBC have him over of course for the New Zealand leg of the of this summer and he'll be doing the World Test Champs but I was jammy enough to be in a commentary box next to him working for a, another organisation out in Australia New Zealand and so on and, and he, uh, he he honoured us with a bit of his time and yeah you just sort of stand there and I mean I'm quite I'm quite sort of tired and weathered of this job um, most of the time. But every now and then you do have a moment that, that elevates it from the humdrum and to share a like a broom cupboard in 30 degree heat with a crappy little fan in the corner with Jeremy Coney. That was a moment where, yeah, I did actually take a bit of time to think, right, yeah, this there are worse things to do in, in life, you know. And he was just... <laughs> He was just magical. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I know, I know. That poor is, me, poor, poor me. That that is lovely. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the line that always sticks out with me uh, about Coney, John Surtees, who works here at the o at the Oval, he's a Surrey head of com communications or whatever, and and he heard that Coney might be around this summer, and he said, "Look, when Messi comes on the market, you got you got to buy it, and you got to move quick." <laughs> So I think you'll be hearing a bit more of Coney uh, for English or uh, British audiences uh, this summer via Surrey, hopefully. But yeah, he's, he's the doyen of doyens. Wonderful. Um, England have named a T20i squad for the Sri Lanka series later this summer. Um, it's pretty much full strength, which isn't what Morgan predicted early in the year. There's no Stokes and Archester injury. Uh, there are a few interesting recalls. David Willey's back in the side. Uh, Chris Wokes, who's not played for England in T20i cricket since 2015, is back. He had a couple of good games in the IPL before that was postponed. And Liam Dawson's back. There is no Matt Parkinson. Um, and I wonder what he needs to do to get into that squad. He's got 87 wickets at under 16 in T20 cricket, an economy of just over seven. Um, we've talked about it loads. We don't need to go into it now. But I do wonder if Adil Rashid gets an injury at a, just before a World Cup in India. You want, you want Sorry, Matt is Parkinson. Rashid in that squad? He's in that squad. But yeah. as in if he gets an injury, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want... You want Matt Parkinson to have more games in him before then. Um, it's kind of willfully pragmatic, isn't it? To say, you know, Dawson is our left arm spinner. We have our we have our wrist spinner and so yeah, be it. I just don't think it is pragmatic. Like, if Rashid picks up an injury just before the tournament, very, very few T20 sides don't have a wrist spinner in there. 
Um, and Parkinson's not played that much international cricket. And for as well as he's done recently for Lancashire, um, you, you kind of want him exposed to international I mean, there, cricket there before. Could be, there could be a, an element. There's of, nothing on that series far, as well. Far be it for me to kind of back up the back up the selection, but there could be an element of Dawson very very unlikely to play, rather than um, Parkinson carry the drinks. We'd rather him knocking people over left, right, and centre for Lancashire in the blast. That 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 might be the because I looked at that and thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. But then. Rashid and Ali are going to play. Um, you know, the, the chances are that Parkinson might have spent another month or so of his career running around making drinks for other people. So that, that might not be quite as, as bad, you know, just to placate the Lancashire fans. I know they're very, very a- angry about this, but that might be the reasoning behind that. That is a, that is a valid point for sure. Um, the T20 Blast, that kicked off this week. Uh, a reminder that you can still sign up for our fantasy game, the Cricket Draft, powered by Wisden at fantasy.wisden.com. Um, there's a prize for the winner of each individual game week. So if you've not signed up, you still can. You can still win prizes. Um, but you've you've watched more of it than anyone else in the world. Uh, what 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 the, what the highlights? What the highlights been well, for you so far? There have been some been some some really good stuff actually on on the TV. So you had the um, the uh, the champions uh, blow up spectacularly to uh, to tie a game against Worcestershire at New Road in in Sky's opening. Opening game, um, and Ross Whiteley kind of was was a big part of that. He probably went under the radar a bit, but he caught an absolute stunner of a catch out deep mid wicket, diving forward, um, which kind of turned the game round in in Worcestershire's favour on that particular night. So that was pretty special. He then did it again on Friday night at Northampton. Um, Will Jacks uh, played an absolute oh, brute of an innings. Well, actually, I say, I say brute. I mean the hitting was brutal. But it was it was very pretty as well. You know, the six over extra cover up into the grandstand was something of a, of, of rare magnificence. Properly threatened the record for the quickest blast hundred as well. Yeah, he was, well, he was he was, he was fifteen it. balls for the fifty, wasn't it? Yeah. And it took a, an extraordinary run out from uh, from none other than Paul Sterling at back yeah. point, John T. Sterling, um, to to uh, to get rid of him. So that was pretty. And Tom Curran actually back to a bit of form yeah. bowling at the death albeit you know slightly different bowling at the, the back end of Middlesex's 11 to international cricket but even so I mm. mean um, he's looked pretty good um, but the moment my moment of the week has got to be um, a lad playing who wasn't born when the uh, when the blast started back in 2003 wow um, the first blast baby <laughs> first blast baby <laughs> Neil, born Neil Lennon's yeah. son Pin oh is that what it is that's right Neil uh, so yeah Pin Lennon who so called because he was sort of very thin um, and had a head a little bit like a pinhead, but also because his fingers were always pinned together. He, was, he hardly ever played opening batsman for Sussex, top lad. Uh, but his son Archie, at uh, tender age of sixteen and uh, and three quarters, made his debut on TV. His first touch dropped an absolute sitter at backward <laughs> point. It was just an absolute sitter, and the, the only excuse I can come up with was that you know it was kind of like adults' kit. So maybe his hat slipped over his ears and the peak obscured his eye because he was just like the tiniest little thing. Um, and then very, the very next over, uh, he was brought onto bowl. He took a wicket with his first ball. And his celebration was lovely, Celebra- wasn't it? Yeah, skipping around like, yeah. a, like, a, like, a, like an April lamb or something. It was, quite, it was brilliant. He but took three for, three for 14, what, man of the match. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty special. And another sixteen-year-old as well at Sussex. We talked That's about right. Dan Ibrahim the the week yeah. before. Yeah, um, I'd swear, so Ian yeah. Salisbury said that you know they've thrown him in. They've kind of they've got the backing. He and um, uh, blah, 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 James Kirtley who's sort of sharing coaching duties. So Sauls is in, is responsible for the four-day side and um, and Kirtley the the T Twenty team. And they've said you know they both said you know it's going to be going to be tough. Perhaps not so much in the T Twenty because they look a bloody good side to me. Phil Salt was dynamite as well. Um, but in the in the four day stuff, it's going to be tough. But their average average age for their four day team in the in the championship is twenty three, twenty four, I think. So that they've got the backing of the club to kind of do that, and you know the the cards will fall where they may, and, and you know who knows in two or three years time they might reap some dividends from it. Absolutely. Um, sorry, and Kent are three from three in the South Group. Durham are unbeaten in the North Group. Um, I actually watched. Uh, well, the the Knotts Worcester game from the first day was on in the pub that I was at. Um, and it was really interesting how everyone was was glued to the finish. And like I was with five mates who aren't really into cricket, but they know who Moeen Ali is. Probably don't know who Alex Hales is, but everyone was gripped and just made me think 
how has T20 cricket not been on free-to-air TV at one point in the last 18 years? Um, I think if you actually show people what a finish to a T20 game is, it was like if you're, you're in a pub and they had like a Carabao Cup game on and no one's really paying attention and then it goes to penalties and everyone's suddenly watching it. It was kind of like that. Um, everyone was gripped. And I thought, yeah, um, people should have been watching this stuff a long, long time yeah, ago. A good game. Amazing game. Absolutely amazing game. Um, uh, the England women's test that we talked about last week, that starts tomorrow at Bristol. The England squad has been trimmed from 17 to 15. Sarah Glenn and Freya Davies, the two to drop out. The 15 include Emily Arlott, who we talked about last on last week's show. She took a hat trick in the Rachel Hayho Flint trophy. Proper action, that. Yeah, it's just she's a proper fast bowler action. 23-year-old seamer who uh, seems to have caught the eye and according to various reports, actually looks quite likely to play in a test match as well. Um, she gave some nice quotes after a call up. She said, I'm probably as shocked as anyone that I got the call. I didn't even think my name was as in contention to be considered. The um, Yeah, that, that gets underway tomorrow and we'll react to it on next week's show. Um, elsewhere, there is a test match, a test series currently taking place that forms part of the current World Test Championship cycle. So South Africa, West Indies, um, the second test of that series will probably actually finish after the World Test Championship final, which is quite funny. Um, in the first... That sums up the whole thing. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> doesn't it? Really it does, doesn't it? Um, uh, they need us to take over, Joe. Yeah, well, well, we'll, 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 we're about to get there. We're about to get there. Um, South Africa beat West Indies by an innings in the first test of that two-game series. Um, there were fifers for Norkia, Rabada and Ngidi. And there was a, there was a debut for my boy, Jaden Seals, the 19-year-old West Indian. Only, got, only played one first-class cricket before his debut. He took a three for... Um, on his debut. That's a, that's a proper team. three, that, isn't it? Nor- yeah. Norkia, Rabada yeah. and Geely. That's a serious, serious new, new ball attack. Man. Decent mm. gas. You, yeah. I, I hope you've put a, a COVID contingency into your uh, into your plan that's coming up, by the way. This is pure <laughs> utopia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, I know. Well, I mean, that. that's, but that's the reason why this game is finishing course, after the yeah, final, sure, obviously. Of course, yeah. fair point. Fair point. Um, Oh, the World Test Championship final obviously get, gets underway this week. Um, we've talked a little bit about New Zealand, but... But 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 how, how do you how do you see that that final going? New Zealand obviously with a couple of tests under the belt. Yeah, really good I mean, performances. That's, a lot of players in form. It's going to be quite hard to pick an don't eleven. Don't underestimate the value of that for sure. Um, you know, look, India are playing what a couple of intra squad games, etc. Or have played intra intra squad games, and they're kind of you know, I don't know how much of <laughs> they're, they're good for getting acclimatised really, but they're not sort of as battle hardening as um, as getting through 30, 40 overs in a test match might be or whatever. However, if you, when you look at the, the squad, the players they've brought over, boy, they've got, uh, they've got some skill in that side. Um, and I, I, I suppose, for, for as far as New Zealand is concerned, their bowling attack, you'd be thinking to yourself, you know, you could very easily catch India's top six cold. Don't forget, you know, England, England we talked about England's batting woes. India's batsmen, with the exception of Rohit and Rishabh Pant, did not fare a great deal better than England's did in the last series. So confidence-wise, you know, somebody like Ajinkya Rahani is under quite a lot of pressure. He's their go-to man away from home, isn't he? Um, captain the, you know, the, the team to, to victory in Australia, etc. Made 100 at Melbourne. But still, he's, you know, his numbers have been declining and declining and declining. And he had a rotten old time of it in the, the test series against England. I think he averaged 16 or 17. Shubman Gill, unbelievably talented, the top of the order um, with Rohit. But again, he's kind of very, very green if you'll pardon the pun, when it comes to, uh, to to playing opening batting here in the UK. Pajara, obviously, we all know about him, terrific player. So, I mean, they've, they've got skill like you wouldn't believe. Coley will be desperate to come over here and show, you know, that that um, that his troubles against the moving ball in the UK are beyond him. Although, you know, the last time India were here, he, he showed out how classy he is. So they've got fantastic batters who perhaps might have appreciated a little bit more of a, of a lead up um, on the fast bowling side Boomer, Ishant, Shami they got Siraj who was so very impressive Shardul Thakur M- Umash Yadav so they've got all the bases covered and it will just depend on whether or not they feel they need to play um, uh, they feel they need to play four and one or whether they might go three and two I suspect they might go three and two Southampton not seeing the pitch guessing a little bit but whether we've had you would imagine that they might think to themselves you know what well, we can we can certainly with Ashwin and uh, Jadeja both fit and available to play. We'd play both of those and we'll pick our best three out of the, so out of the three quicks. Pant six, Jadeja seven, Ashwin eight, 
three pick your three quicks. Yeah, yeah. That's that's, that's, that's how I, that's how I might go. But you know, again, we don't we haven't seen the surface. We don't know what sort of state physically everybody is in. Um, but they're they're gonna they're gonna be able to pick an absolute belter of a team. In fact, the only the only guys that they're really missing, um, who are pretty much on the outside anyway, would be. Sahar and Kale Raul who were awaiting fitness tests. So they've got they've got everything that they could possibly want um, to pick from. But I still think the New Zealand have the edge simply because of the, the the type of cricket they play at home and the fact that they've just had two test matches. I mean, you know, New Zealand have used England for as a warm up for for a World Test Championship. I, I saw some, that's exactly what's happened. <laughs> I, I, I saw people cheekily uh, suggesting that New Zealand should have followed India's suit by. Um, play themselves to get a competitive warm up for, for, the, for the series. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I can't wait for this. Yeah, yeah I'm, no, I'm so looking forward to it. Yeah, it's amazing because I was thinking New Zealand big favourites, but then when Butcher's reading out that team, that's like, quite that good, is, isn't that it? Is yeah. Quite a good team. <laughs> and I think you've always got to take into account there'll be some sort of unforeseen event that denies New Zealand at the last, <laughs> even though they've entirely dominated the game as well. Yeah, but in, India never win these global tournaments either. So um, some, someone's got to win it. Someone's got to win it. Or make, or well, actually, it could be a draw. Could be a draw. Yeah, they're going to share the trophy for the race three days. <laughs> you know, and the, other, the other side to all the of this. Four that genuinely isn't very what, good. What we can, what we will see as well, I should imagine, for all the, those people who are kind of kind of still disbelieving of the idea of a sort of like, you know, batting technique and whatever is two top sixes who are kind of as orthodox as it gets, really. Um, you know. That is a very good point. Aren't they? I mean, they're yep. just, you know, Rohit is as good a technician as, as there is. He might, again, his failures might come from, you know, deciding that he wants to hit the, the third ball of the innings for six back over the bowler's head or whatever, but it's not it's nothing to do with his sort of his general method of play, yeah. forward, back, bat straight, yeah, and they, they all, they, even from, say, someone like Tom Latham, who's sort of kind of with faint praise described as like a nuggety left hander. When Tom Latham wants to play a straight drive, he's, everything is absolutely perfect, and the flow of the bat speaks for itself. And, and right, he's, apolo- he's on the apologies. furthest side, he's on the furthest side of the, of, of, of the story, really. And then you look at, you I know, didn't mean the, to lead us back down this road again. Sorry. No, 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 no. All right, all right. You can cut this. You can cut this. But he's right. He's yeah. right. You know. Yeah, bang on. The, the, the 12 batsmen that we'll see are all pretty old school style players. Um, Joe, how do you pick an 11 for New Zealand? They've got 17 men who are in pretty good form. There's a lot of 50-50 calls, but mm. that shows a pretty good side, doesn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, I think the batting lineup, I think it's is, is almost like kind of take your pick. I think Will Young might well miss out despite having batted so well um at edge baston i think you've got the i like the kind of the grand Tom mitchell choice who are kind of almost exactly the same player that they can go for i think the grand Tom probably wins that one i think patel the spinner plays uh so then you've got one of the gun seamers if you play to grandham and patel um oh yeah you do don't you yeah i've just i was gonna go and pick 12 yeah you're gonna pin me down to an exact <laughs> yeah. 11 yeah, yeah it's, 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 like, it's like picking an england front three in football you're like oh greed has got to play phone has got to play stern has got to play but then you can't pick. Yeah, I genuinely players. don't know. I, I, well, Henry almost certainly misses out. Yeah. I think that's... But, yeah. but even, so you've got Jameson, so you've got Jameson Wagner, Wagner, Bolt, Salvi. Um, if you play De Grandom and Patel, you can't pick all four. Uh, Simon Duell on commentary said he'd drop Wagner, which... Really? Is, is bold. Uh, but to be honest, like a very good cricketer is not going not gonna to well, play. Depends. If you back Jameson to be able to do a job at, at seven, then you could potentially get away without playing yeah. De Grandom, but that's quite a... He hasn't... Shown quite enough yet to be a test number seven. Yeah. No, but you could, you could. I assuming, think, assuming I think Wagner doesn't play. Do you think so? Yeah, I think he will I, play. I, I mean, no, I think he misses out. I, I think they're going to go two and two as well. Uh, yeah, I don't think they're going to. I don't think they're going to. I don't think they're going to see the need to play two left arm quicks. And so there will be Jameson, Bolt, Southey. God, that's a tough call on him, isn't with, it? Given with, what with he's done go- over the last. I, well, yeah, I think so. But then, but then they've not. They've not had all of the others to pick from all at once, have they, in recent times? Mm. The, the one thing I would say is that they quite often don't pick a specialist spinner at home where the pitches are quite flat. And I know mm. Patel bowled very well, but I can kind of see them not picking Patel. Yeah, right. This is this I, yeah. what I was going to suggest. Right. And we, I was talking to Coney about it. Did I mention I did some... Oh, really? Yeah, you, did, some you know Jeremy yeah, Coney? Did, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he said maybe Watling at six, assuming he's fit, as he will be almost certainly, and then maybe Santa at seven. Jameson at eight, and then you can. But play Santa's those, not yeah. in the squad. They've they've named a fifteen, which he's not in, so he's definitely oh, well, that's not playing. Yeah. Off the charts, then I would imagine. <laughs> uh, but I, I, that, was I that was just what Cody told me. That was only yesterday. <laughs> that was only yesterday. So he wasn't. okay. Um, yeah, I, I, not I, that then. I, I can I can kind of see them just not playing a spinner. 
Um, they've done that. They've done that before. Viola's um, and Williamson, if you need it, it's pretty, yeah. Well, Butch is going to get angry. Mm-hmm. I can yeah. sense it already. <laughs> especially, especially <laughs> when you're going with Ashwin and Jadeja as well. You get a two spinners and. I, I and just want Jadeja and Patel um, to play in the same game of cricket. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Matrushka doll Jadeja, yeah. isn't he? Patel, he's amazing. Yeah, I think, I think that. Molded himself. I think completely. that prospect kind of gives England batsmen nightmares, doesn't it? Mm, um, cool. So we've got we've got that to look forward to this week. Um, Joe, there's a new magazine out. Um, what's what's in it? Oh, what is in it? God, it feels like a long time ago that we did this one. Obviously, there was quite a lot going on at the time. The, the cover story is how do um, England's three emerging fast bowlers in Stone, Overton and Robinson force their way into, into contention. It already feels a little bit like we're behind the story on this one, but I would still urge you to pick up a copy and, uh, and well, read the interviews. I, I don't think so at all. I mean, I think uh, obviously off-field events uh, kind of overshadowed Robinson's performance, but from a purely cricketing point of view, his, his debut properly changes things I you're think. right and obviously and Anderson didn't have the best two test matches that we're not going to fall into the trap of writing him off but but there is that there is going to be that building pressure all it will take is one or two more um, less effectual test matches and, and that will really come to, to the fore and anyway yeah as you say the way Robinson bowled uh, on his test debut leaving aside with other stuff suggests he's got a, a long test career ahead of him uh, so how do you get them all in how do you how do you balance the side we're not going to go down that <laughs> route again um, but that's that's the main thing um, we're looking at and the other thing we're going to have some discussion about, uh, obviously, the World Test Championship final yeah. around the corner. We decided, uh, you involved as well, Yaz, and Ben and Phil and I uh, sat down and reworked the whole thing. The Wisden World brilliant. Test Championship. It's utterly flawless, yeah. apart from possibly some things we've missed. But it's, be- it's certainly better than the one they came up with. And, and we're, we're safe in, in the knowledge of doing that. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, so that, that, that was, that was why, that's why uh, we, we did it. So what, what are the... What, sum up what the actual format is and, and then we'll go into what, why we think it's better. Well, one of the main issues, I think the main issue with what we've had so far is that not everyone plays everyone in a cycle uh, and, and teams play a different number of games. Uh, so what we've done is we've added the three test playing nations uh, who aren't included so far. So Zimbabwe, Afghanistan, Ireland. So we've got 12 in total. Then we split them into two groups of six based on the ICC test rankings at the time of the start of the new cycle. Uh, and then within your group of six, you play each team in a three test series. So you're playing 15 test matches. Over two and a half years. Not So we've extended the cycle by two. a year. So actually the fixture congestion, it sounds like quite a lot, but actually the fixture congestion is, is less than it currently is for the cycle. And then the exciting bit, is Can I just add, sorry, just before you get to the... Sure. With, with the emerging nations, Ireland, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, uh, four-day cricket, four-day test matches is an option. If it suits their board and if it suits the integrity of the competition, realistically, if Ireland and India are matching up, and I think they are in Group B of our setup, then maybe four-day cricket is a more sensible way to go. It didn't feel like it was bastardising the game when Ireland played a four-day game at Lords. I mean, they... Could have won that one. Um, so so there is that element to it as well. Um, and after the first cycle, get together with all the boards and discuss if there re- remains any flexibility with four or five day cricket for certain, for certain games. It being incumbent on certain boards to be able to afford to put the thing on. And, and we do, we acknowledge that, that there will be some untidy contests, um, but... We feel but that's test cricket. We feel that's test cricket. We feel that's the only way that sides like Ireland are going to learn. If you give them full member status, then actually let them play the thing rather than exclude them from the thing, which is meant to be the thing we're all all interested in. And uh, and we've also said, look, that we all know that the international schedule is packed. So this is an opportunity for if India are playing Ireland in a three test series, if they want to play their B team, then then that's fine. And I don't really subscribe to the idea that one side of test match is going to put people off the whole thing unless that is the, what dominates test cricket. And we think the tournament's got enough going for it um, aside from some one-sided contest to, to work. And then, yeah, and then the exciting bit is we effectively... So after we have two groups of six, the top two in each group then qualify for the World Test Championship finals, which is effectively like a, a World Cup or a T20 World Cup, but for test cricket. So you've got four teams who play a round robin against each other uh, over four or five weeks and then the top two teams in that round robin play each other in a big one-off final over six days over six days at, and I think we said if that's a draw then the team who topped the table in the round robin win so there is no unlike the current system where if it's a draw it's just a shared trophy 
Um, you know, and there's there's obviously financial implications, which Phil has gone through in detail in our in our piece. He solved that aspect of it. I'm, say, I'm a natural economist. <laughs> absolutely. Um, Mark, this you this is news to you. Um, oh, so before you to, ask Butch, can I can I tell you a sorry, couple yeah. other things that I like about it? So I think one of the problems with the current system is that very very early on, you're not really quite sure what the teams at the bottom are playing for. Uh, whereas this, a it guarantees countries that don't play that much test cricket a certain number of con- uh, t- test matches but b um there's kind of a realistic kind of progression for a team like bangladesh so a bangladesh might start the first competition as a fifth or fourth seed but a couple of good results in the first cycle they could be a third seed in the next one and you kind of you know using for the football example at the moment the euros you have that group of death uh, Portugal, France, Germany when it didn't go so well for them you could have that kind of situation where you have three massive teams in, in one group because a team like Bangladesh got a couple of surprise results and Bangladesh can be a third seed next time round and that's a realistic way for them to kind of get to the finals which would be a really big deal for a team like Bangladesh and even even now a team like West Indies for example and I think that, that there is that kind of carrot for those teams to aim for that, that is realistic that I like about this this tournament obviously it's it's perfect um, but Birch what do you what are your initial reactions? What's to? wrong with it? Yeah, no, I can't. I can't do anything that's wrong with it. I mean, twelve teams, I too don't many. Think, I don't think I've ever really been sold on the idea of a Test Championship full stop, which is kind of, which is my, which is always my starting point. <laughs> okay, um, not a very no, helpful no, I starting. Mean, listen, I'm, I'm very, very excited about the about this this game coming up. You're yeah. pitching the two best sides against one another. Um, but if you have to have one, I mean, it certainly sounds like a it certainly sounds like a good way of doing it. I particularly agree with the with the fact that it's going to that all series are three match series. I mean, it's just utter nonsense that not only the team, not all teams play each other, and some teams actively refuse to to have series against <laughs> against other sides. We're talking about you, Australia, you know that then then the matches are then well series are played over five, they're played over three, they're played over two, um, and you have a, an extraordinary waiting for. Um, for for the amount of points that you can win based on the fewer test matches that you play. I mean, that, frankly, is nonsense. However, the two best sides in this cycle, as interrupted and as messed about as it's been, uh, uh, would would have qualified pretty much any other way you shake it up, wouldn't they? There's New Zealand and, and, and India, so it hasn't been all bad. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I kind of, I, I'm willing to willing to give it a go. I'm willing to see. The one thing that bothers me slightly is the idea that you might have to play four day test matches for for some of the other sides. I mean, clearly, playing a game over less days gives gives uh, gives the underdog a bit more of a chance than it would do if it was over five. We, um, um, we did um and R on that one, I think. But I, I understand. I understand why you do it. I mean, the, and the other side of that is that it kind of then encourages. You know, Ireland had a fantastic chance of beating England for lots of reasons. One of them was it was like four days after the World Cup final. The other one that the pitch was as green. You know, was was kind of a perfect sort of pitch to ambush a, a, a not did, quite did a bit on early a test on. match team. Did a bit. Did a bit all the way through. Well, they get bowled out for in the last inning, seventy 30, or something. Well, thirty. There you go. Um, so it, it kind of encourages that type of um, that type of thing for for home teams, but there is no perfect way of doing it, and and that's as good an idea as I've as I've heard so far. Worth saying that they the ICC have changed the points format for the next cycle, so it's not done on. So every every test match is worth the same number of points, and the table is done by points per game. Um, so they have slightly slightly changed it and probably slightly mm. improved it. So just an, it, a, another uh, crucial but con- potentially controversial point of this tournament is that all bilat- there are bilateral series which exist outside of this tournament. So the Ashes is nothing to do with this. If you play a World Test Championship series, that's a three-test series standalone thing, um, which we think actually rather than rather than detracting from those uh, series, it will mean that this when you start a series, you know this is for the World Test Championship. It's not it's not muddy waters of potentially three test matches being towards the Ashes or, or the whole thing being a World Test Championship and an Ashes series. When these test series come around, they are just for the World Test Championship. Everyone knows that and everyone knows what they're for. Uh, and that means that England would have played Australia in a test series, which isn't the Ashes, which, I mean, it has, has happened before, but it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but we think it's better to separate these things and mean actually less is more in the World Test Championship. Not every series going towards it means the ones that are have a bit more hanging on it. <coughs> just on the numbers you'd average five test matches a year. So for Ireland, it's two or three test matches more than they would be playing. For England, it's it's a third of the test match 
schedule that they would have anyway. Same with India. Um, they so would plenty of room. around that number. So plenty of room to play the teams that aren't in your group that you would otherwise, otherwise play. That, that side of it's very, very good. It's very well done. Well, well done, everyone. Well Thank done, everyone. you. Um, what, what else uh, <laughs> in the magazine do you want to shout about? Uh, the Temper Vavuma. Yeah. Interviewed by Neil Manthorpe. Friend of yours, brilliant, brilliant journalist, broadcaster and writer. Um, top, top man. And he's, he's on our editorial board. Well, sorry, he's our South African correspondent and he contributes. Anyway, he, he secured the Temba Bavuma interview, obviously in the midst of a chaotic time for South African cricket. He's in the slipstream, been appointed there, the limited overs captain. Um, and uh, it's one of, the, one of the most readable interviews where the quotes do the job for you you know Neil didn't really have to do much more than just tie them up and present them and you know he's a really really sharp impressive geezer is Temba Bavuma and he's got great kind of fortitude and conscience and you could see how much he burns for the cause and they need these kinds of figures at the moment um and yeah he, you know, he spoke about the symbolism of it of course but there was there was a lot of good gnarly cricket stuff in there you know and i thought the light is one of the best interviews we've run in a long time i think i thought it was interesting when he said a lot of it was a lot of the thought when he got given the captaincy well is he going to be good enough to justify the captaincy given he hasn't played much white ball cricket for south africa um though when he has he's played well yeah, yeah he's played really well he's he said the flip side is actually well if he's if he's thinking about captaincy he actually is putting less pressure on himself as an individual and he thinks actually give him some freedom as a batsman now you've seen you know, a few games isn't it yeah i mean you know that it could play out very differently to that but i thought that's an interesting uh way of viewing it and kind of compartmentalizing the, the different different aspects of the role that he's got now because it's a big mm. job it's one of yeah. the toughest jobs in cricket yeah big time um you can get the magazine at wisdom.com forward slash shop as always joe what's your moment of the week uh, so my moment of the week came from the Dhaka T20 Cricket League obviously. in Bangladesh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> Keen follower. Um, yeah, Shakib Al Hassan goes ballistic. Uh, if we thought he might be keeping a kind of low profile after his, his ban for not reporting illegal approaches, he's doing a pretty poor job of it. This was bizarre, really. Um, so, I mean, there was two sort of threads to it. He, he, the first up, he, he has an LBW appeal against Mushfiqur Rahim, which is turned down by the umpire. It was out. Uh, it, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it did look. It did look out. Um, but that's it, not the point. He turns around, appeals, then boots the stumps over at the non-striker's end right in front of the umpire, then proceeds to kind of shout in the umpire's face. Um, so not a great start. Noticeably, no one else kind of comes in. Everyone just sort of leaves Shakib to it. Then just an over later, a bit of rain starts to come down and the umpire decides to take the players off the field. Uh, Shaki races in from, from extra cover or something. Uh, furious, shouts to the umpire again, picks all three stumps out of the ground, throws them on the floor like a three-year-old uh, and then picks another one up and stabs it back into the ground near the umpire. I which didn't was, quite understand the symbolism so, of that so, bit. It in even, fairness, it, the, the game in that competition, you need six overs to result, not five. And the umpires took them off after 5.5 overs when Shakib's team was clearly <laughs> going to win. So that was quite funny. They ended up coming back on the field. They ended up, they ended up coming back on the field in the end and Shakib's team did win. But oh, I would... Under, no. uh, yeah, I guess I guess you probably shouldn't do that. But you can understand his frustration. This is exactly... One more. exactly uh, my first team at my club, exactly the same thing happened earlier in the season. They took really? them off with one ball needed. <laughs> and it's not the umpires who are taking them off, it's the captain of the team oh, who dear. is walking the team off. Oh, it was dear. chucking it down, yeah. apparently, but well, it's one w- ball needed for a result. It's certainly, it wasn't chucking it down in this circumstance. <laughs> at all. So perhaps it's just one out. And there is, I mean, I've read a bit around this, and there seems to be an underlying thing of the kind of quality of umpiring in Bangladesh is poor, and there's lots of accusations of biased umpiring. So there is probably that happening beneath it. Um, but it's quite an interesting piece by Mohammed Izam on Crick Info talking about this is kind of the next natural step for Shaggy. Basically, the Bangladesh, Bangladesh Cricket Board have let him off the hook so many times over the years, largely because he is so much better than the rest of their players that they always give him a bit of a ban, but then less than that ban because they want him to come back play. And even this, they gave him a three game ban and a fine of, I think, 6,000 US dollars, which I was looking at the regulations in club cricket. I mean, that would probably be a 10 game ban in, in club cricket if he, if he did what he did uh, in English club cricket. Uh, it's it's not it's not great basically, and it's just another. I mean, he's a fascinating character and cricketer, obviously a brilliant cricketer, um, hugely valuable to Bangladesh. But also, I think there's a bit of sort of embarrassment at, at the the guy that they've tried to give another chance 
um, throwing his toys out of the pram quite so publicly. And obviously these days it's all on video, so you can see the whole thing on, on Twitter. But he rounded it off with a fantastic uh, apology on social media, which he apologised for his human error. Uh, and then said, hopefully I won't be repeating this again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks and love you all. So yeah. there are no promises there. Yeah. It might happen again next week. Oh, but Yeah. yeah. Um, and finally, we mentioned a few weeks ago, Phil, that you spent a day with Beefy, an afternoon at Beefy's. Going over um, to Beefy's house. <laughs> we'll, we'll be playing the first half of that interview today. It's about the 1981 Ashes, the build up to it and all that, which took place 40 years ago this year. Um, Phil, briefly, your recollections of that interview? It remains a fever dream from start <laughs> to finish. Just go and listen to it. Um, well, so we'll, we'll, we'll play uh, that interview in a bit. Um, the the interview was brought to us in partnership with Botham Wine to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Botham's Ashes. Um, everyone knows who Beefy is, obviously. Um, what is less known about Botham is his lifelong passion for wine and the art of creating it. 40 years as an international cricketer and commentator took Botham to wineries and, and vineyards all around the globe in the development of his own range of wines. He worked passionately with renowned winemakers to create bespoke blends to his exacting standards. Only when a wine is good enough to go on his own table does Ian allow his name to go on the label. For more information, go to bothinwines.com. Um, here is the first part of that interview with Phil. Sir Ian, thank you for inviting us into your, your beautiful house. Um, 40 years on from the infamous uh, summer of 81, um, you came into that summer holding the captaincy, of course, having faced the might of the West Indies that spring and, of course, the previous summer as well. Um, that tour in itself, the the, 81, the early 81 tour, was at times controversial. It was obviously heartbreaking as well with the story of Kenny Barrington, who unfortunately died midway through the Barbados test. And you were 25-year-old, managing as tough a tour as you can imagine. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we also had the Robin Jackman affair. Yeah, uh, the Guyana game. Yeah, so it just, it, it really just escalated. And uh, But we held it together pretty well as a team. Uh, Kenny was a massive blow because he was, um, the old colonel as we called him, he, he was very much part of the team, very much involved. Um, his official title was assistant manager, I think, but as far as the team, he was our coach. And uh, just great company. And one of the nice things about Kenny, and this is something, I, a lesson I learned very early on, you never hear him say, in my day. Never referred to in my day ever. It was always up to date. And um... and I spoke to Graham Gooch, actually, funnily enough, last week, and he made 100 at Barbados in the shadow of Kenny's, Kenny's passing. And and he he was quite choked up, actually, about about the memory of Kenny and it, it seemed that overshadowed the whole of whole of the tour really well I got a phone call um, in my room um, with my, myself and my wife had been out and I'd seen Kenny that evening and uh, we were going out and he was going out and it all happened in around midnight I think one o'clock something like that and uh, they didn't they rang me I was the first I was captain I suppose it was logical they rang me at about 6.30, because they didn't want it coming from somewhere else. Uh, someone banging on the door, a news reporter, and saying, you know, reaction to this. So I got up and went uh, with AC, up to AC Smith's uh, room, the team room, and uh, sat there with him, and we ummed and ahed, um, and I said to him, he said, do you want to play this test? Do you want it? And I said, yeah, hang on, I, I, look, let's think about the colonel. He would want us to play this test. He wouldn't want us to do anything else but play. And he'd love it if we could win. And uh, so the players, uh, we pulled the players in, told the guys, and uh, I think just about everybody, I mean, there was a lot of tears shed. Yeah. And, uh, but there was a lot of tears shed. They started when we all went out that next morning and we lined up the two teams. And the West Indian boys loved Kenny as well. And there was a lot of tears there, and they'd all got to know Kenny. He was that kind of person. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a very emotional test. And you know, I think we were all loved it when Gucci got 100. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a massive shock. And with everything else that was going on around us, mm. um, 
we did well. And you know, at the end of the day, we lost one nil uh, at home. And I think it was which way around was it? One nil and two one, uh, two sorry, one nil and two nil over the two series because we played them back to back. So yeah. so consequently, the teams were quite close. Indeed. Um, well, certain members of the team, you know, each team, was, were pretty close. Um, and again, that's probably why it was well magnified by Kenny's uh, uh, magnified Kenny's death with both teams. Um, it hurt both teams. So. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you were in charge for all of those test matches, as you mentioned. Um, you were relatively young, comparatively young in the job, and only three and a half years into your own test career, uh, and you were playing one of the all-time great teams in the history of the game. Uh, could you, could you enjoy it? Were you fully invested in it? And obviously, we'll come to what happened in the summer regarding the captaincy. But where were you against the Windies? Uh, I was, uh, I was learning. I was learning as I was going along, literally. Yeah, sure. Uh, and you know, you're coping with different situations. Uh, players are all different. That, that was one of the biggest problems I had. Was when someone drops the simplest of catches, you all go and pat him on the back. Right? I go and kick him up the ass <laughs> because I, I just don't get that. Yeah, yeah, we're support, we're applauding failure, mm -hmm. and that's something I really, really, really have a problem with. And I, you know, I'll be honest with you, with hindsight, um, maybe I should have said no. Uh, but hindsight's a very useful weapon, isn't it? And, you know, it's a very easy way out of things. And you don't but, say no to that question, do you? Well, 24 years of age, and you get the knock on the door and say, "Would you? Uh, would like you to be captain?" Well, you're not going to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I say, with hindsight, maybe if I had said no then and left it for a couple of years. But do you know what? Look, I'm a great believer, and you you ride the torpedo to the end of the tube. You, once you start going, you go, and there's no getting off. And everything that happened, I believe, happened for a reason. And who knows, 81 might not have happened if it had stayed as captain and what have you. If, so maybe it freed me up. Let me let me um, be more expansive. Mm -hmm. And also I was, wasn't having to worry about um, all the players and how everyone was coping. And um, yeah, I, I, look, I probably better off being a sergeant major right. than being the general. Okay. Well, we'll come to the general who replaced you in a, in a moment, obviously. Um, Rolling into that summer then, uh, it must have been a relief in a way to be out of the pressure cooker of that West Indies tour. And then rolling into the summer, the Australians were here. Trent Bridge was the first test match. You were still in charge. We should have won that. And you said it's before. You should have won if you caught your catches. Is that fair? Well, yeah. And, and one of my most reliable catches, uh, David Gower, uh, dropped to Skyer. And if he'd have taken that, we'd have won the game. And so, you know, but it's all ifs, ifs, if only. If, sure. it, doesn't, it doesn't happen like that in professional sports. So they uh, scraped through. Um, I look at it now and I think, uh, do we deserve to win that game? Yes, I thought we did. Um, but you know, we made up for it. Sure. If you had won that game, history would have taken a very different different path because... Exactly. Yeah. I'm quite happy with the path I took. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, quite happy with that. Um, what, was, what was it like to play that Australian side at the time? Because you'd have been already good friends with a number of them, right? AB was in there, of course, Rod Marsh, Dennis Lilly, Kim Hughes. These were players who not only had you come up against, but who you'd spent some good times with as well. So into that Trent Bridge game, what was the buzz like? What was the atmosphere like between the two sides? As you'd expect, England and Australia. Um, there's always a little bit of mud throwing from each side yeah. in the build-up, which is I always find quite amusing. Um, and but you know you're talking about some of the greats of the game, Lily, uh, Marsh, uh, mm -hmm. Border, one of the finest players I played against, tough competitor, guts it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you know, I think we had a lot of respect for both sides, and I've always been a a, a big fan of Australia and Australian sport. Uh, when you think of the population they've got, I think at some stage they held men's and women's hockey. World Cup, Rugby League, Rugby Union, cricket, mm -hmm. and probably a host of other games we've never heard of. <laughs> but but um, they're they are the ultimate competitors. Yeah, um, they don't know when to lie down, um, and I think that's why I played the game. Probably, some would say in those days in sort of the Australian way, believed in attacking rather than defending. Um, but. 
you know, every England cricketer, every cricketer, when he starts out, wants to play for England, for his country, or Australia, or whoever. But there's something special about England v Australia. Yeah. You know, it's it's um, it's the Poms against the convicts. Yeah, and it, and it, and there's a lot of good banter out there, um, aggress aggression. Do you see something of yourself in them as well, in their in their temperament? Do you see that's why you've always worked so well against them? I've also uh, got a lot of friends in Australia, mm. and um, do you know something? I, I think the biggest compliment I've ever had from an Australian was when they turned around and one of the guys, I think it was Kim Hughes, said in an interview, well, he's more Australian than he is bloody English. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's that's a pretty big rap coming from an Aussie. Yeah, yeah, you'll take but, that. Yeah, but uh, no, I've got a lot of friends over there. Um, normally spend about three months a year over there now mm -hmm. um, with the wine business, which uh, we're tucking into here. Mm. Love to share it, but bad luck. <laughs> um, but no, we... Uh, so I'm over there a lot. Uh, I... Great friends, very close friends, AB uh, and myself, um, DK. Mm. I've had some great nights with him yeah. in Perth. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's uh, I think nowadays, I'm not sure that the players have the same sort of relationship okay. on the field that we had. Yeah, they might have a drink at the end of a game, but I, th I think boys that are playing in something like the IPL, that you know, they're all, they're, they'll all become good mates. Uh, but in test series, I'm not so sure the way it was. But um, certainly, um, if we were on in the field all day, and you come out and it's 33 degrees, and you're in Perth, and you go and sit down in the dressing room, it's only a matter of minutes. You're taking your wet socks off and your wet shirt, and the Aussies are walking in with a slab of beer, and uh, you're sitting down with a cold can. And uh, when Tom O was playing, you'd usually get a, a, a a very large amount of seafood delivered uh, with his contacts in the, in the fishing world. Um, so it actually, you, we, had, we didn't need a, um, a match referee. Yeah. Because if there were anything to discuss, it was discussed there and then. And you policed yourself. And, and it, was put, it was put to bed. Yeah. Um, Even in the absolute heat of battle, there was never any fallout into the evening or...? No, no not really. No. No, I, I think... Um, in fact, we actually mixed quite a lot, you know, go out with the wives and, you know, Jane and Alan would come out, Kath and myself. Um, you know, it, it, um, one of the guys would be having a barbecue and yeah. go along, and which continued when we came over here and the Aussies, we'd have a barbecue. On the on the off day of, yeah. of the Headingley Test. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah. Some, as you say, pedigree, great cricketers there as well and some other names that we could mention. Um, Coming out of Trent Bridge, despite being one down, were you still reasonably chipper about your team's chances? Yeah, yeah. I thought we. I. I, I didn't think we deserved. Uh, we should have. We should have won that game. Um, didn't. And then at Lords, I went there and I started to feel not quite so happy with my myself. Okay. Um, because what a lot of people didn't realise is that uh, the. Alec Betts, the chairman of selectors, and his team were decided to give me game by game captaincy. So I said, I, I thought about it at the Lords game, and um, at the end of that game, I walked straight up to Alec Betts uh, and I said, Alec, uh, I can't work like this. Yeah. I said, uh, my family can't live like this. I can't work and live like this. And the team deserve don't deserve this. And I resigned. Which I thought was quite amusing because about half an hour later, the boys got the television on in the dressing room and everyone's getting changed and having a drink at the end of the game. And uh, he comes on, Alec Bedser comes on, and he said, Well, he resigned, but we're going to sack him anyway. And I thought, Well, is that necessary? <laughs> I thought, Fly me. Um, Not the most tactful approach. No, no, but that was what, you, what I was working with at that time. And, and so your game was obviously marked by a kind of sense of fun and expressiveness and so on, but had that reality of a game-by-game, game, week week-by-week role heading up the England cricket side, had it begun to chip away? Uh, by the Lord's, by the end of the, well, end of the Trent Bridge, when they started the one test at a time, I yeah. thought, well, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Um, so I was very happy in the news conference to turn around to them and say, well, there's a bloke called, bloke called Mike Brearley. I think I might bring him back for the rest of the series. I said, because I think he'll be able to 
settle the dressing room and um, because a lot of the players were on my side upset. There have been a few the other way as well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's fair enough. That's, I don't mind that at all. No, I thought, uh, I actually thought, no, time to walk. Uh, so, a week later, you've identified the right person to take over. Thankfully, they've listened to you. And Mike Brearley, the great Mike Brearley, takes control of the side. What was the build-up like to Leeds the day or two beforehand? Well, the, the two players, probably the most involved in that game, uh, Bob Willis and myself, were... Bob wasn't um, originally picked. Yeah. And um, Breers took over and uh, he rang him and Bobby said, um, mate, I'm not playing against War uh, for Warwickshire this week to make sure I'm 100% fit for the heading the game. And Breers said, OK, that's good enough for me. And then when I got to the ground and I stood there and he walked up to me and he, he said, uh, he was always called me Both. And he said, um, Both, he said, um, are you sure you want to play this game? I looked at him and I said, what? He said, are you sure you, you, know, you want to do it? And I said, Briers, who are we playing? We're playing Australia. Of course I want to play. And he said, great. He said, I think you're going to get 10 wickets and 100. He wasn't far off. No. He not far no. off. But, uh, but he undercut you a bit on the runs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I always remember that game because one of the reasons, the, apart from the obvious, but one of the other great things was that Bob, the reason they were thinking of leaving him out, the selectors, uh, was because he bowled too many no balls. Well, at Headingley, he didn't bowl one no ball in either innings, and 14.3 uh, or whatever overs it was, he bowled off the reel coming down the hill when I let him come down the hill. And uh, he came down the hill, eight for 43, mm. uh, one, of the, one of the greatest fast bowling uh, spells I've seen. Mm. And uh, to keep going. But you, you, we couldn't talk to him because he, he just got, goes into that, tunnel where my torpedo goes that tunnel he goes there and he was he was just uh focused on doing what he does best and that's bowling as quick as he can and taking wickets and he would take the wicket there'd be a little bit of a pat on the back and then by the time you look around he's all halfway back and at the end of his run yeah almost at the top of the ground at Headingley and uh he's waiting and he's waiting for the next Aussie to get out there and I said to the guys I said just leave him yeah just leave him well We'll come to the finale in a wee bit. There's one or two other points of business to get to before we get yeah, to yeah. Bob's afternoon. The, the Brearley story is just a little glimpse into the way that he worked with individuals. But how did he work specifically with you? And, and he's spoken, obviously, very warmly about the benefits that you brought to him on the pitch and off it. That he, you enabled him to be a bit more freed up, to loosen him up a little bit, to enjoy the game more than he had done in his early years. How did it work the other way? What did he bring to you? Um, I think the biggest thing that Breers brings to you, he knows exactly what to say, when to say it. And I've been asked many, many times, and I said the best way of describing it is a little bit like if you ever watched Star Trek, Spock. Right. Yeah, Spock, I'm a bit of a Trekkie. But, I never saw that <laughs> yeah, coming. Yeah, yeah. But a bit of a Trekkie. But, <laughs> but Spock, it was just like Breers was just, you felt like how I think they wanted Spock to be portrayed. Mm -hmm. Maybe they got the idea from Breers. <laughs> but he, uh, he, he looked, he, he could look into you and he, I think he was reading your mind. Mm. And you felt like he was probing. Mm. And obviously it didn't take too long up here and to work it <laughs> out. But, uh, but he did, he got the best out of the players. And the I think he just, but he treated everyone differently, accordingly. Yeah. And that, that in itself is quite a, uh, quite a, a, a massive achievement, to be yeah. honest. There's a lot of complicated characters out there. And uh, he, um, he was brilliant at it. And, you know, nowadays they probably wouldn't even play Breers. They'd say he's not a good enough batsman. But do you know what? I'd pick him just for that, uh, those moments of magic when he just produced something. And more often than not, his idea came off. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's um, he's a special guy, mm. and uh, much respect for him. Do you still chat much? Yeah, when I see him, uh, you know, he hasn't been a hundred percent just recently, and uh, I am I'm not working with Sky anymore. I've retired from the commentary box, um, and so I don't see him as much. You know, don't see him at the games because I'm not at the games. Mm -hmm. You know, my, the only games I really go to now are Durham and England up here in the north. Sure. Um, as chairman of Durham, which I, I love, I love the job. Um, but yeah, Breers, when I do bump into him, it's it's great. I love it. Yeah. And Cathcat has a lot of time for Breers as well. He was uh, very good to the family. Right. 
Good luck. Um, Australia batted first in that one, 400 odd for, for nine. I think declared you picked up six for though. And I remember on the commentary, because I've watched the video inside out, <laughs> they were saying that there was a, a new spirit about your game. And well, that I might think, be an easy way of summing it up, but was that fair? Yeah, I think the shackles were off. Yeah. yeah I think I was getting burdened, bogged down, perhaps is a better word, with the captaincy. Uh, and also with what was going on off the field. It was. It, you know, the kids got abused at school. Oh, your dad's, your dad's rubbish and all this. And Liam got into a couple of scra scrapes and, you know, he's only bloody this high. Sure. Um, and, you know, people can be cruel. Yeah. And kids in the playground exceptionally, which we've all witnessed and seen in our years. But uh, that was unnecessary. And it was quite nice, really, just to ram it back down a lot of people's throats. Yeah. Um, and I did enjoy that aspect, I have to be honest. Um, you made a, a 50 odd in the first dig, but England failed to avoid the follow on. And then I think we were naught for one overnight. I think Gucci had probably had his front pad blown off. <laughs> yeah, Terry Oldham, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, famously, most of the team checked out of their hotel, assuming that the game would be done that following day. You walked out maybe just after lunch, middle of the afternoon. 100 odd for five, I think. Mm. Obviously, still a long way behind, and soon that was 130 for seven, still 90 something behind when Graham Diddy joined you. Yeah, picker. Yeah, take yeah, it from there. Sadly, no longer with us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, he walked out, picker, and uh, he came out there. And, you know, people don't realise he was a big lad, tall, well built, strong lad. And he came out and he stood there and uh, he said, Well, what do you want me to do? I said, Enjoy yourself. Yeah. I said, I'm going to. Enjoy yourself. Look, you know, it, it wasn't the greatest wicket. You know, people have to remember this. It, it was a pretty average wicket. And uh, he had a bit of luck. He had a bit of luck. I had a bit of luck. He played some shots, that, shots rather, that um, Graham Pollock would have been proud of. Uh, the best knock I've ever seen him play. And I played a lot of cricket with Worcester together. Um, and he was quite magnificent. It's uh, fascinating how it works like that, isn't it? That yeah. One day you, you, you play on a different plane to all other... Well, the, the, the Aussies, oh, he'll nick it, he'll nick it. And he did, yeah. Out the middle of the bat to the boundary through <laughs> extra cover more often than not. Um, we, we enjoyed ourselves and there was a lot of good banter out there between us and we both enjoyed watching the, the old Aussies getting a bit uh, uh, frustrated, angry. Um, was it ever going through your mind? And the scene that I remember is going back to Breers as well and others, Boyks as well on the bench, on the on the balcony pointing at you to stay there towards the back end of the day when maybe the mood is... to me. No, okay. No, you wanted to say to Chris Old. Yes, yeah, sorry. So he sorry. said to Chris yeah, and he's pointing at Chris Old and then he said to me. Right, right. And you know what? I didn't because uh, he was playing well and I wasn't going to make him do anything different or send him to do anything different because he, he did well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Aussies got stuck into him but he hung in there. Yeah. Um, 29, I think Chris Old got, which yeah. gets lost in the narrative but without that, there wouldn't have been well the... there was a partnership yeah a partnership and it was more time the Australians were in the field yeah uh, the pitch is not getting any better so uh, he did a great job and um, you know the everyone chipped in really with the bat the lower order yeah everyone hung around as long as they could I mean they were a pretty good <laughs> very formidable actually bowling attack the Aussies had um, but um, didn't really have a spinner in that game and that might have been a mistake yeah. Yeah. So there again, why would you? The pitch was doing all sorts of, mm -hmm. again, hindsight. But um, Was there ever a moment in that, that innings, and I know I think you were one four five not out at the end of that day, but towards the back end of the day, were you starting to think, do you know what, something miraculous might actually be on the cards here? Well, once we got to 100 ahead, yeah. uh, I said, we're in this yeah, all okay. the way. I said, this pitch is not good. And the Aussies, of course, we got rolled out, and then the Aussies came in, and then they were... I got wood out early on. Yeah. Graham Wood, and then uh, they were 50-odd for one. Yeah, needing 80. And Bob got, got the end he wanted. And the rest, they say, is history. You said earlier you can't think of many better spells than that. One, one element that makes it so much more fascinating and dramatic is that he felt he was bowling for his career. I think, you know, I think Bob actually... Every, just about every game at that uh, time of his career with the injuries he'd had uh, he just felt that I've got to make the most of this and he was running in beautifully no no balls it was all it was all there yeah. 
Yeah. It, it's a little bit like Phil Mickelson whacking it down the down the fairway Did you watch yesterday. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Stunning. All the way through. But it was like that. It, it just all came together for Bob and. Uh, uh, I think every game he was worried that he's going to wake up the next morning and that's it, the knee's gone, it's finished, it's done. Uh, so he kept going, and uh, but fair play to him. Um, he, you know, he had a lot of painful nights after yeah. bowling. So. Yeah. Just going through it then, Kim Hughes nicks off for a duck, I think, and you, you take him at second slip, and yeah. then Graham Yallop, I think, goes for not many. Yeah, he got caught by Gap. Yeah, short, a short leg. leg. And suddenly it's on. I think lunch comes at that point. Yeah. And, and are you regrouping? Is it, is it a case of sitting around having stern team talks or just cracking on? Do you know, we were, all, on? we were actually very relaxed in the dressing room. Right. We, we felt, well, come on, boys. Got nothing to lose. Yeah. And Bob was chomping at the bit to get back out there. Right. Um, and Have you ever seen him like this before? This Not as intense as he was that game. Yeah. Not that, that innings. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I haven't. Um, I will always remember just staring. He was looking straight through me, and I thought, oh, I'm, "I'm your mate, remember?" Right. <laughs> but he he was just tunnel vision. All he wanted to do was knock the next uh, Australian batsman over. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Lilly came out and up cut a couple and yeah. threatened for a moment. Yeah, he had a little partnership there uh, with, with Ray uh, Bright. Ray Bright, it? yeah, and. Uh, and Gat, I think, I think Gat took that great catch running in, but I think he, I think he thought it was a pork pie. <laughs> but uh, you know, he, he dived in and took that Gat, and and then I think I thought, right, we've won. Yeah. Um, there was always going to be a little bit of resistance down the order because you know, DK wasn't going to block it and hang around, so he tried to be as aggressive as when he plays his best cricket when he's aggressive with the yeah. bat. Yeah. And uh, when we got him, I, I was pretty confident, and then Bob not Ray Bright's middle stump out the ground. And, let it all begin. What a great moment that was. Um, bustling Bob's famous interview on the balcony <laughs> afterwards with the, the Yorkshire faithful down there. Uh, and he, he gave him the evil eye and delivered one of the great press match, uh, post-match <laughs> interviews. But <laughs> I wouldn't have fancied being on the end of it, let's put it that way. Well, do you know, I think he answered everything. With, I think it was all uh, one, answer, one word answers, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah, did that come from a sense of the... Press having given him a hard time and, and the sense of the walls I think, caving yeah, I in think, somewhat. I think there was a few of us that were pretty. Uh, I mean, I remember there was the press were waiting for me down the stairs, and I actually wrapped a towel around me and just walked straight past me. Right. And I said, "Yeah, all to write." Yeah, you know, we all just said the same thing. You know, you wrote what you wanted last week. Well, keep on writing. Yeah. But then that settles down. You know, that was just. Um, I think it's probably as much as anything. It was the adrenaline that was pumping through us all mm-hmm. at that stage. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was. Uh, Many funny things that happened in that dressing room that evening because the dressing room attendant, which I, I think most people have heard this, but it's absolutely true. The dressing room attendant was a young lad um, called Ricky Roberts who was uh, South African. And he was 14 years of age and he was our dressing room attendant running around. And, uh, and I got on really well with him and uh, sat down with him and chatted away and had a, um, a coffee in the evening. would make me a coffee in the mornings and we'd sit down and... So I was intrigued, you know, wanted to play golf for a career, but he said, I love cricket. Anyway, uh, end of the match, I should get some champagne, and they said, well, there isn't any champagne in the pavilion. Okay, where is it? So well, the Australians have got it in their bath, thinking they were going to be celebrating a victory. So I said to Ricky, I said, Ricky, just go over to the dressing room. In those days, they're opposite each other. At Eden. I said, just knock on the door and just ask to say to the Aussies, look, you know, can the England boys have your champagne because you won't be needing it? And he did. 14 year old kid. He went over and knocked on the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> and all I can see was Ray Byton and Rod Marsh, I think it was, as, he, as Ricky came flying back through the door. <laughs> but um, do you know, we stayed mates. We're still good mates now, Ricky. Uh, he went on. He was uh, carried the bag of Ernie Els to three major titles. I thought I'd heard the name. That's him. Yeah, so he was caddy, and I see Ricky quite a lot now and uh, and with Ernie and uh, reminisce about that uh, that moment yeah, I th- he's get forgiven me now I think but, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but he did he came through horizontal Phil cheers Joe cheers cheers Butch this has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast enjoy the show tell your friends and leave us a nice review in the podcast app cheers <laughs>